Hey, this is Mark back with another incredible episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week we talked to Ali Tamburo. And this is a fellow that was sentenced to 17 years in prison. And his majority of that stint was in San Quentin, up in San Francisco. So one of the most notorious, hardcore prisons that is out there for a variety of different reasons. I think it got its reputation back in the 70s and 80s, but a lot of very violent criminals that are in that institution. A few years ago, and really from the direction of the warden of that prison, they started these various programs that would bring in and help educate these different inmates that eventually were going to be released. And so I got the great opportunity to interview Ali, and he's a guy that went through a program called the last mile to entrepreneurial program. Uh, Ultimately, he had a chance encounter with Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, and now he actually works for his organization called Chan Zuckerberg. And just a fascinating conversation about what it's like inside the joint and his pursuits in terms of Uh, increasing his knowledge base that one day when he got released, he would actually be uh, able to go out into the world and be productive. So just a super cool interview. Amazing. I've never talked to anybody in prison. And so this was first for me, certainly overcoming adversity and finding his way certainly fits the bill in this case. So as always, continue to rate and review. It for sure helps with the rise and the popularity. We've got great podcasts coming on and coming up amazing people doing incredible things. So that's that. And I also want to give a shout out to our new sponsor, Violets Are Blue Skincare. We did a podcast on Cynthia not too long ago, and the whole pod world just blew up. And a lot of people are ordering her products. They're all natural. This came from a result of her having cancer overcoming and really understanding the things that we put on our skin that absorb into our bloodstream. And she created this product line. It's awesome. So try it out. And with that note, let's Go talk to Allie. Here we go. Hey, everybody, it's Mark. I'm back with another amazing pod. And this one is right out of Shawshank Redemption. Not quite, but we're going to get into some pretty heavy stuff today. I've got Allie Tambura all the way in San Francisco, and I'm broadcasting, as always, my new home in Sun Valley, Idaho. Allie, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so your story is really unique, and I want to set this up just a little bit. So one of the podcasts that I follow is a podcast that Lance Armstrong does called The Ford, okay? Mm -hmm. And he had been up in San Quentin, and I'd never heard about any of this stuff. And and so the venture capitalist up in in San Francisco who founded this organization called The Last Mile, which we're going to get into, was talking about how, you know, he had gone in to talk to a bunch of the inmates in San Quentin, and he was blown away by how many just really bright, interesting, full of question people that he saw. And he gave me this insane statistic that something like 60% of all inmates that are released with no training end up back in jail. And something like 100% of the people, the inmates that have gone through this first mile program have not returned. They're, They're successful in society. They're anchored. They have a purpose. And that sounds like exactly what that has happened to you. That's correct. I went through the Last Mile program. I've been home for a little under two years now. And the Last Mile, I have to say, was really transformative to my life. It was one of those milestones. And it was just a brief time ago, but it was one of those milestones when I look back at it and think about where I am today. And I'm still kind of in awe on how much of an impact that just a single in-prison program has had on my life. Yeah, so I reached out to Chris. So I, I was like, what is this last mile program? So I reached out, I looked it up on online, I found it. And surprisingly, Chris, the CEO who founded this program, reached back to me. And we had a great conversation. This might have been like two weeks ago. And I was like, hey, I would love to come up to San Quentin and interview a bunch of guys who are going through this program, you know, and and talk to other guys who have successfully graduated and been released from prison. And just, I find your story and other stories of, of uh, the other inmates that I'm, I'm going to be talking to in the next couple of weeks 
so fascinating. And so I was actually scheduled to go up to San Quentin on the 15th of June. I'm coming off of Denali on the 14th up in Alaska. So that's not going to be the right fit. But my intent is to go up there at some time in the future, according to Chris, and go through this. But let's talk about, before we get into, you know, everything about the Last Mile program, let's talk about, you know, you spent the last 12 years in San Quentin. And the first question I have for you is like, all of a sudden, know the reputation with San Quentin is that it is one intense place with the worst criminals that are out there. And, you know, how did you end up in that situation? Well, you know, prior to my incarceration, Mark, I, I owned and operated a small geotechnical company here in the Bay Area. And really, like, like the last thing I'd ever think of in my life was that I would end up being incarcerated. But, you know, while my professional life was really just skyrocketing, my personal life was heading for disaster. And in 2000. Four, I was charged or threatening to shoot my now ex-wife. And even when I was charged, I just really had no idea of how punitive the criminal justice system is. You know, I take responsibility for my role in getting myself tied up in the criminal justice system. I'm still a firm believer that it, it, it does not uh, do justice, not only to people who are accused of crimes, but also to victims of crimes and to society. Our criminal justice system has really, really gotten way out of hand. You know, I think 5% of the world's population in the United States, but ha- we have 25% of the world's prison population. So was my description of San Quentin accurate? I mean, and the reason why I ask you this is because as you were just retelling that story of, you know, your personal situation, it just seems pretty severe that you'd go from, you know, some kind of assault to, you know, the worst prison, one of the worst prisons and most intensive prisons you know, for gang members and murderers and all this kind of stuff, and San Quentin. I mean, maybe, you know, there was some penalty, but that just seems pretty severe to me. Well, well, I, I think, let me kind of quantify, like, my prison stay. The, the way the prison system works is, or the California prison system in particular, is when you first go in, you get assessed. So they send you to what, what they call a reception center, and they do things like they give you a reading test, a math test, they run you through a battery of medical exams, and then they choose where to send you. So I originally wasn't sent to San Quentin. I was actually sent to a prison that was much, much worse than San Quentin. And some of these really high violent prisons aren't on the national or the international radar like San Quentin is because they're fairly new and they're located out in California in the Central Valley. So I was originally sent to Corcoran, which is a level four murder max prison. I, you know, witness people, every type of violence imaginable. I, you know, I, I try not to, I don't want to put your, your listeners through the violence that I witness, but, you know, everything from murders, sexual assault, to stabbings and, and you know, all of, all of the things that, you know, that happen in prison. So, Ali, what is that like then, you know, when you're witnessing these stabbings and sexual assault and, you know, fights and all this other intense stuff? It would seem to me that you would just be literally sleeping every night with one eye open. I'm sure you're in your own cell, but what's going through your mind? One of the side effects of incarceration and particularly being in a hyper-violent atmosphere is that you get this hyper-vigilance that you're always looking, you're always waiting for something to happen. And it's a wearing thing. It just, it really starts taking its toll. It starts taking its toll on your mental health, starts taking its, its toll on you physically. It's just, it's really, really hard to explain. The only other people that I've, I've talked to that really can speak to the sensation is people who have been in combat. So like our veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, they can speak about the same type of wearing hypervigilance that you have to learn. Yeah. So in your prison cell in this first location that you were at, are you sharing a cell with one or more inmates or how does that work? Yeah. Usually you you share a cell with, with another person and that's a whole nother kind of dynamic sharing a really small concrete and steel enclosure with another human being and those type of interactions. I mean, we could, we could have a whole separate talk on that at a later date, but yes. Well, my youngest daughter goes to the University of Arizona and, you know, she's, they, all the freshmen have to start off in dorms. And so, you know, that is literally like throwing dice and who you're going to pick up, you know, same interest. Are they, you know, are they nice? Do they steal things? Do they, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I've heard it all and I can only imagine that 10X of 
of somebody that's been incarcerated, you know, that and you're in a small space. So that'd be very intense. Right. I mean, I mean, the idea of, of a college dorm that gives you a certain amount. There's a certain amount of correlation there. But the difference, the big difference is you don't know who you're in the, in the cell with. I mean, you can be in the cell with someone like myself who was in a emotionally charged situation and made a bad choice in that situation. Or you can be in the cell with someone who is hell bent on criminality, someone who just murdered somebody and who has life without the possibility of parole and really has lost like, you know, all hope. And it can be very, very, very dangerous in the cell with particularly the person that you're in the cell with. So when you first entered this first prison, were there any kind of programs that were set up, you know, in terms of, you know, what we are going to get into is about the last mile and in, in really creating a structure that you can go in and learn a skill or skills that will benefit you, you know, when you get released. Was there anything like that going on in, in that particular prison? No. Unfortunately, most of the prisons in California that were built in the late 70s through the 80s and early 90s are in California's Central Valley. So they're in like what we call the salad belt, lots of agriculture, but they're really distant from, you know, any urban center. So what's unique about San Quentin is it's located in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so it's close for people and volunteers to get into the prison out there. There's literally nothing. The only programs that they had, they they do have adult basic education. So if you don't have a GED or a high school diploma, and those classes are limited, there might be one or two classrooms and a yard of, you know, 1200 men. So there's long waiting lists and stuff like that. So they can't facilitate that for everybody. I mean, the Department of Corrections does its best. And even those classes, you know, from my vantage point, aren't very productive. Then from there, every once in a while, you'll have AA or NA. But as far as job training and programs that you find at San Quentin, they're non-existent in most of the prisons out in the Central Valley. Yeah. So I read this quote from your aunt that she told you when you were sentenced that you would have the opportunity to improve yourself, like really, you know, get quiet, understand what's going on and make the most of your situation. And, you know, you certainly did. When was that point then? And why was the point, you know, you go in, as you were just talking about, you get assessed, you know, your reading skills and your aptitude and physicals and all the stuff. And so they place you in one of the California jail systems, prison systems. And so you're there, but now they switch you to San Quentin. Why did they do that? Well, they didn't do that on their own volition. What had happened was I, using my aunt's advice, you know, I started ordering books and reading like a lot of the, the masters, you know, the Tolstoy and Dolchevsky's and the books that, you know, I probably should have read in school, but, you know, skipped, did the cliff notes kind of thing. And I really got obsessed with reading and I thought, man, this is great. So I started taking correspondence courses and the correspondence courses, they suit a purpose, but there's nothing like in classroom education where, you know, where you're in there with other students and hear different perspectives and different dialogue. And so I heard about this program called the Prison University Project that was running in San Quentin. And what was really unique about it is that all of the instructors were volunteers from UC Berkeley, UCSF, Stanford. So all of the Bay Area colleges were sending professors in to teach inmates in classroom studies. And so I wrote them a letter and they sent me a letter back of, you know, that I was approved once my points got down. So at that point, I was the level three inmate. And there's basically five levels in California. There's death row. And then outside of death row, the highest is level four, level three, level two, level one. And so if you can manage to stay out of trouble, manage, you know, not to be a victim of violence, your points drop annually. And so I had a really progressive, you know, I don't have a lot of nice things to say about the Department of Corrections, but I do have some nice things. And I had a very progressive counselor. And, you know, from the day I got there, he looked at me and says, man, you don't belong here. Yep. And so when I told him about this program at San Quentin, he says, look, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to get you there. Just stay out of trouble. Stay, as they say in prison, stay out of the way. And if your points get low enough, I will send you. Not only, and usually you, it, it takes 12 months. The 12 month cycles you go, uh, you go in front of a hearing and they tell you either you're doing a good job during your incarceration or you're doing a terrible job or they'll tell you you need to get a GD. And if you're doing what they want you to do, they'll lower your points every year. This counselor was so progressive. He took me to what they call a biannual. So he took me at a six month increment. I was still just a hair over in points, but he overrode me and got me transferred to San Quentin. So, but going from the prison that you're at 
And I get the motivation because you're, you know, you've got these brilliant professors from Stanford and Cal and other places coming into the prison. And you talked about being in class. Makes total sense to me. Weren't you still, though, at the same time going into a much more intense situation in terms of the inmates that are sentenced to San Quentin? So that's one of the things that's really, really, San Quentin has this notorious name. I mean, you know, if you're in Johannesburg, South Africa, and you say San Quentin, people are going to know what it is, right? Yep. Nobody knows Corcoran State Prison. Now, it's probably the first time you've heard it, or Salinas Valley State Prison, or Old Folsom State Prison. Some of these prisons have uh, violence that's just off the charts. What's happened at San Quentin? San Quentin was really notoriously horrible through the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. But what happened is there's a segment of inmates. I, I hate referring to people as inmates. But there was a segment of of people sentenced to prison who had life with the possibility of parole. And them combined with a really progressive warden, Jeannie Woodford, started bringing these programs into San Quentin and started allowing a lot of community involvement. San Quentin has, I think they have over 3,000 volunteers. And that's pretty amazing when you consider it houses about 4,000 people. Mm Mm-hmm. And so they really started changing the culture of the prison. It's not to say that violence doesn't happen in San Quentin. You know, it's still prison. And, and as a matter of fact, you know, they're having problems now. They've had a couple of stabbings in a part of the prison called H Unit and yeah, lots of problems. But the violence level is not on the scale that it is at these other prisons. And for the first time when I got to San Quentin, like I could never tell my family, you know, I'm coming home. At San Quentin, you can maneuver so you can actually avoid almost all of the violence. I mean, it's not 100% guaranteed, but it's almost guaranteed, where with some of the other higher level prisons, it's not. And so, you know, programs like the Prison University Project and The Last Mile And there's a multitude of self-help programs, Insight Prison Project. There's a group in there called GRIP, Guiding Rage into Power. It's a really, really powerful program. You know, out of that program, Guy Jock Verdun calls it peacemakers that he makes. And, And I've used some of those tools since I've been out that I learned in that class. So the community engagement and the programs that have changed the complete environment of the prison there. It's actually more like a learning environment than it is a prison. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It, it sounds like the warden ran the prison more like a, you know, a college atmosphere, right? I mean, obviously you're still locked up and there's a lot of violent people in there, but there's all these opportunities to improve and better yourself. That's correct. Yeah. So, you know, actually kind of going back to that original movie correlation that I was making the Shawshank Redemption great movie, but how the one main character had really created all this curriculum to go in and read books and build a library and then teach all these different guys how to read and then eventually try to get their GED. So really cool stuff. So a couple couple things that were just popping in my mind and this is like, you know, totally random. But like when you get down to you know, you t- you talked about knives, right? There would still be stabbings. Yes. So those are my words in terms of knives. But in terms of stabbing, like how does somebody get access to whatever kind of weapon, whatever you want to call it, that's going to inflict pain on somebody else? Wow. So the amount of intuitiveness, just sheer engineering that I witnessed while I was incarcerated. You know, guys, taking apart Sony Walkmans and making tattoo guns, making lighters out of paper clips. I mean, there's some stuff that I wish I had like this demonstration of some of the things that I've seen, you know, people who are incarcerated make, you know, just if you give someone enough time and just a few resources, they can build just about anything. And so when you think about knives, I mean, everything and anything can be made into a knife from I mean, one of the the most notorious things I've seen is a shampoo bottle. If you take a shampoo bottle and heat it up very slowly over a flame, and usually you can use toilet, they make these things called burners out of toilet paper. You heat it up very slowly and you twist it almost like a licorice stick. And you twist it really, 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 really slow and pull. And then pretty soon you have this piece of plastic that's about the size of your pinky. Yep. And you set it on the concrete floor of the cell and, and you let it harden yep 
And then once it's hardened, people would sharpen them, use the concrete to sharpen one end. And then so now you have a knife that's undetectable by metal detectors and dangerous. You know, it's, it's a lethal weapon. Yeah. And that's just to name a few. I mean, they've made them out of pieces of the barbed wire fence. You know, one of the things I, I learned is that you can actually cut metal with dental floss. Hmm. Dental floss and Comet. And these guys were able to cut chunks of metal out of the solid metal bunks. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is creativity, right? And creativity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you know, when you are locked down and you have time to think about uh, things that most times you wouldn't be thinking about, you know, it's amazing what the human spirit can come up with. So how long was your sentence, by the way? So my total sentence, I originally was sentenced to, uh, I think it was almost 17 years. I went back on appeal. I got a little bit of time off. So the end of my sentence, my, ultimately my sentence was 14 years, eight months. And out of that, I did a little over 12 years. Yeah. It's just, you know, again, I go back to what I started by saying, which is it to me, your sentence based on what you did was a little severe. And I, you know, I have no idea what the tears are, but it just seems like, you know, justice did not, prove out in this case. But, you know, it, it turns out to be a great story here. And, and that's where we're kind of going with this whole podcast. So now you get into San Quentin, you're understanding and maneuvering through all these different great programs that, as you said, there's these amazing professors, instructors coming in from around the Bay Area up there. And then you had some kind of chance meeting with Mark Zuckerberg, the co-founder of Facebook. I did. And, you know, that was really towards the end of my incarceration. I mean, there was a lot of work and a lot of things that I had to do to get through there. But from what I understand, the way Mark came into the prison was he read Brian Stevenson's book, um, Just Mercy. And he was really shocked that, like, he couldn't believe some of the things that he was reading in the book. Um, and I think also one of the books on the reading list that Mark and some of the people at Facebook were reading was Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. I'm not sure which one of those books sparked Mark's interest into coming into San Quentin, but he made a surprise visit. And it was while I was still learning to code. Actually, it was at, it was at the end of the third cohort of the coding curriculum there in San Quentin. Which is called and Code 7370? Code 7370. Okay. And so I had built a capstone project, and I was fortunate enough to give Mark a demonstration of the capstone project that I built, which was a data visualization I built for the University of Pittsburgh. So how do you get that gig? So a real progressive professor, I'm at a loss for her last name, her first name was Michaela, mm -hmm. heard about the last mile, said, hey, I've got this data on childhood diseases. It'd be really cool if you guys could build a data visualization. So you know, she went through the proper channels. The data got vetted to make sure it was safe for the prison environment, came in to the prison. They gave me this data set and said, hey, build something, make this, you know, so people can look at this data. So I built a data visualization where people could scroll through literally from the 1920s till current the impact of childhood diseases across the United States. Wow, that, that's just incredible. So that was through the program code 7370. So that's all about learning how to become an engineer, how to code, right? Right. And, and, and I think, I think you hit it on the mark there. It's not just learning how to code. What Chris and Bev and all of the wonderful people that run the last mile were able to do is they really mimic what it's like to work in a real world environment. So we use these things and I'm probably, I don't want to get lost in jargon, but like GitHub and agile development strategies and really, 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 and then the whole idea of collaboration and code review and learning to download different libraries and, and how these libraries, you can add these libraries into your, your project and really understanding what open source means. And so all of these things they build together and or bring together in the curriculum to build an environment that is a real software engineering environment. Yep. So how many hours during the day are you allotted to work towards this? Because what I'm leading up to is, is this like, you know, hey, honey, I'm going off to work. You know, I mean, literally, you know, the doors open up at the prison cell. You go get your breakfast, whatever, and then you're off for the day until you return at the at the end and, and then you go to bed. So, yeah, the particular program, the coding part of the program was Monday through Thursday, 
And you're there between seven and eight hours a day. So usually breakfast is about 5.30 in the morning. You go grab your breakfast, you give you a sack lunch, and you move through the prison to the industries part of the prison, and you sit down at a desk, and you know, you're know you off into the cyber world. Yeah, well, I mean, look, at I'm just trying to imagine myself, if I was in that situation, you're occupying your mind. And there's another guy that I had on the pod months ago, Captain Charles Plum, and he was a guy that was shot down in a plane in Vietnam during that conflict. And he was in a prison cell for six years. If you can imagine that it was like six feet long by three feet wide and, oh i can imagine that yeah so yeah 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 so you can imagine that but what you probably can't imagine is that he had no ability to you know occupy his mind no books no paper no pencils you know no radio nothing no tv right so mm -hmm. you're at least in a, a situation trying to better yourself um, versus what he had to go through you know much more beneficial not just to yourself but to Society, when you guys, you know, were released, in your case, when you were released. Um, so let's talk about what the last mile, because we keep making these references about what the last mile program and like through the last mile and the guys involved in the last mile. But what is the last mile that I had, you know, researched and found and heard through Lance Armstrong's podcast? Well, the last mile has the, it's, it's multifaceted. If, if you take it as a whole, it's a program that is there to teach inmates to be self-sufficient upon their release from incarceration. I started in the last mile. They had an entrepreneurship training program, not in the coding program. And so the entrepreneurship program basically was to come up with an idea, a business idea. The idea had to have a social component as well as a technological component, write a comprehensive business plan around the idea. Then we had a demo day where we got to pitch our business idea to venture capitalists and Silicon Valley business leaders. And so I went through that, pitched my idea, idea got accolades, and it was really flying high on the experience. And it was at that point that Chris and his wife Beverly said, hey, you know, these guys are talented. They, you know, we should see if we can bring a coding curriculum in here. And so in the next few months, they started this coding curriculum. I applied. And I got to say, it wasn't just, it's not one of those things where you just get accepted, right? And there's a lot of things that you, you need to be able to do, you know, have, have some basic problem solving skills, your behavior inside the institution. You know, if you're a person that's in there getting in trouble, you know, the last mile, it's not to say you can't be in the last mile, but you have to have at least six or seven months of not being any in any kind of trouble before they'll let you in. So there has been, you know, there's instances where people have to reapply because there's some, you know, disciplinary problems inside. But, you know, once I, I got into the coding program, and I have to tell you, I thought, oh, you know, I'm pretty good at math. And, and you know, all of that was out the window. I, you know, sitting down, it's like learning a whole new language. And they did a really, really good job of walking us through what it's like to be a software engineer, starting with HTML, and CSS, uh, then moving into JavaScript, uh, then from JavaScript into like higher order functions. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to, I don't want to lose you in the jargon here, but really, really in depth engineering. So let's wind this back to your meeting with uh, Zuckerberg. I read that after you got done with your presentation, you asked him, you posed the question, does Facebook or do you ever hire guys who have been incarcerated? Is that right? Well, what I asked him specifically, I said, would you hire someone who is formerly incarcerated at Facebook? And what was his response? His response was apply. Cool. He didn't say yes. He didn't say no. He just said apply. It's a smart answer. Response, you know. Yeah, he's a pretty smart guy. Yeah. So, okay. So now you're coming up on, you've been, you know, you talked about the original sentence was like 17 years and then it got down to 14. And then because of good behavior, I'm sure other things that you were doing, it ended up being about 12 years, which is still just a major chunk. So it's just amazing through this last mile program and code 7370, you know, you learned all these different skills. You're well on your way. But going back to that initial thing that got you put in jail, you know, just the things that tick inside you, the emotional part, were you able to also come to grips and solve that as well? Were there, were there programs to help, you know, bring you back, you know, just to really deal with those emotions, those feelings that, that, that led you to your situation? Absolutely. And so one of the things, like, there's this narrative in the criminal justice space that people are really bad 
and then they do these rehabilitative programs, and then they're good, and then they get out and they can be good. And that's kind of narrow-minded thinking, because there's lots and lots of people. I, I would say a vast majority of the people who are incarcerated are very good people. Due to substance abuse or impulse control, they end up incarcerated, right? And that's not to say that there's not people out there that are just really siloed into this criminal mindset. Those type of people are, are in prison too, but they do not represent the majority of people in prison. And so I did do a lot of work on myself and really, you know, looking, and it's, it's not just about the events that landed me in prison, but, you know, it's, it's thinking about, am I a good citizen? Am I a good neighbor? You know, if I ever am in a highly emotional charge situation, what do I do? And then really learning those tools and then putting into action in real life. I mean, I drive here in the Bay Area. I see people and I really just witnessed the other day people get out of their car and fighting in traffic. And to me, I was like, I can't imagine ever getting to the point in my life where I felt like any type of violence or threat of violence is the answer to handling any type of situation. And I was able to learn, you know, most, if not all of that while I was incarcerated. Wow. I mean, that's just awesome. And the biggest lesson you've learned over those years, you know, since, you know, you went through from day one, you know, you're sentenced and you hear that and it's just your heart sinks and everything else to where you sit today. What do you think the biggest takeaway that you have come away with since you've been released? You know, I think every person on this planet is unique. And specifically, when we have our eyes turned to the criminal justice system, there's this idea that that everybody in prison is a murderer or a rapist and they're, you know, they're beyond reform and we need to lock them up and throw away the key. And I, I say to people who think like that, you know, nobody, nobody on this planet is their worst mistake. And could you imagine, Mark, the worst thing that you've done in your life? If someone put that on you and, and so when you went to go get a job or you went to get housing or you went to school, someone just pulled this up, you know, say was they wrote it on a t-shirt and said, well, no, Mark, that's who you are. You're that worst thing you ever did. And it's, you're not. Nobody is. And so I believe in second chances. I believe as a society, we need to start really thinking about how we look at our criminal justice system. I think it's abhorrent. You mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that approximately 70% of the people who go through the criminal justice system um, recidivate and end up back in there. I mean, as a taxpayer and as a father, I don't think our taxpayer money should be going to reincarcerate people. I think as a society, we need to look very deeply at our criminal justice system and not stand for that 70% recidivism rate. Like people coming out of the criminal justice system need to have clear paths to employment, clear paths to housing, and clear paths to become citizens, right? To be contributing citizens. Like, I, don't, I have never met somebody that said, you know, someone coming out of prison should be, we should make it so they have no opportunity and they go out and commit more crimes. Um, you know? It makes no sense. Yeah, it, it makes no sense to me either. And so really that, and that's my, my focus. That's really my mission in life now. And, and, and you know, when it comes around building tools for criminal justice reform and things like that, that's where I'm using my technical expertise. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not where you start. It's where you end. There was a great movie. And if you, if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it to anybody. It's called The Count of Monte Cristo. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. I've, you know, I think I read most of the book. I didn't get through the whole book. It was yeah. a big book. Yeah. So essentially, it's, it's about this guy, you know, this, this takes ba plays back in maybe the 18th century or something. And, and, uh, they're in this fishing village and these two guys are best buddies. And, and one of the guys is kind of the hero and the star. And the other guy is kind of this jealous sort. And he sets him up. And so the long and short of it is, is the, the kind of the more successful one. He's got the girl. He's got the position being a captain on a ship ends up being falsely accused and then sent off to this prison in the middle of this ocean. It's like a rock, kind of like Alcatraz. And so he's in solitary confinement and they're like the first and it's for life. And so for the first, I don't know, seven years or something, he's in there, he's miserable, he's just rotting away. And then one day out of the, the depths of the floor, the stone floor emerges this old guy who'd been digging for the last 15, 20 years trying to jailbreak and he just picked the wrong direction 
And so he merges out, you know, from the bottom of this floor. And this guy's like this wise old man. And so in exchange for him, for both these guys helping to dig and, and find their way out, he decides to teach him the ways of the world, accounting, finance, languages, self-defense, all this stuff. And so, again, when he ultimately he gets out, and that's a whole nother story, but, you know, he says... He's this worldly guy, and he knows everything, very smart. And so he plots this revenge and all this kind of stuff, which isn't what you're doing. But it's a, it's a really interesting movie. And I look at my own situation, and I went through a kind of a tough 10-year period. And, you know, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But at the same time, I've come away from this, you know, so much more enriched in terms of the blessings that I'm doing now like this podcast. And I think in your situation, you know, I don't know exactly if you would say it was a blessing or not, but... You certainly seem to be on a great path right now. And according to that path, you are now working for Mark Zuckerberg in his other company called Chan Zuckerberg. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. I work for a company called CZI, which is a Chan Zuckerberg initiative. Okay. And we're all about, well, I can kind of describe the company a little better than that, than just a broad overview. We, we have kind of three unique silos, education, um, science, and justice and opportunity. And I work in justice and opportunities, specifically in criminal justice reform. The philanthropy is a couple of years old. It was start by, started by Mark and his wife, Priscilla. Basically, they're giving away 99% of their wealth. And I'd like you and your listeners to go read the letter that they wrote to their daughter, Max. And it will give you a perspective on the company and our mission. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go back to that moment where you're showing Mark. Zuckerberg, this demo, and then you ask him the question. So did you actually apply through Facebook or did you apply through this other organization you're with? So I actually didn't apply. And I don't believe that Mark even knew that I worked for his company until I saw him at my first all hands meeting. I actually, when I left San Quentin, went to work as a developer in San Francisco, did some continued education and learned a lot more about the back end of computer science. So there's these two distinct job classifications. One is front end engineer, the one is back end engineer. I learned a lot of the back end engineering, went to a computer boot camp in San Francisco. And then after that, I took a college course and then did some, some work around data structures and algorithms. And so like I, I was, you know, really, really committed to continuing this path that the last mile set me on. And then once I graduated and, and finished all of these programs, I started applying for full stack developer roles. And what happens in this computer science and computer engineering roles, there's recruiters out there that find you on platforms like LinkedIn or through word of mouth. And yeah, I got an email in my inbox from a recruiter, and he said he was with CZI. I, I had no idea what CZI was. I did kind of what I expressed I wanted your readers to do, is, is to go on the internet and read the letter that Mark and Priscilla wrote to their child, Max. And so I read the letter. I was like, wow. And then they told me that they were you know, really trying to make meaningful change in this world. And I thought, wow, and how awesome would it be if I could work in criminal justice reform? So I applied and I went through a rigorous interview process like everybody else. And, you know, I had to talk about, you know, my history and put that on the table. And inevitably, I got hired. And, you know, I'm thankful for the opportunity. But this by no means was somebody saying, oh, I'm going to give you a break because I met you while you were incarcerated. This was something that was done on, you know, the merits of what I've learned and all of the hard work that I put in and ultimately was decided upon by the skills I have to offer. Yeah. I mean, look, I don't think it was a favor either. I mean, it, it's a classic where preparation meets opportunity. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you had been setting yourself up for years and years and years, educating yourself, learning how to code, going and getting further education, going through the last mile program. And so when you stepped up, I can't think of a better candidate than you to be involved in this program based on the way, you know, your, your history, your background and what you consider to be fair. I mean, I don't know anything about, you know, what's unjust or not within the prison system. Of course not. So. 
you know, you've got all this unique insight, which just puts you a step ahead. Now, I don't think everybody needs to go to prison, of course, you know, to get that insight. But, you know, that was your unique qualifier that I'm sure was very appealing. In addition, you're a smart and bright guy. And so, again, that preparation of all those years and then the opportunity coming up and then Zuckerberg probably wasn't him, but whoever, you know, the hiring manager was to recognize that and then bring you on board. So, listen, name of this podcast, again, Finding Your Summit, all about overcoming adversity, in your case, <laughs> some serious adversity, and then finding your way. And it seems like you certainly are, are on your way and doing great things and, you know, really contributing in a positive way. Yeah. You know, and, I, and thank you for having me, Mark. And I, you know, in closing, I just want to say, like, I'm not an anomaly. There are hundreds, if not thousands of Ali Tamburas in our local and state lockups. And the only thing between me and them is that, you know, I won the lottery in opportunity. When Chris and Beverly brought the last mile into San Quentin and a lot of the other folks that are running great programs in San Quentin, it has had a significant impact on my life. And so these type of things need to be replicated in other prisons and lockups. And one of the things that really, really resonates and should resonate with your listeners is that these programs are the programs that are making our community safer. Yeah, yeah, that that makes total sense, absolute sense. Well, listen, Ali, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm very grateful, and your story is amazing, and I just wish you all the luck in the world going forward. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, buddy. Thank you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. If you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on MarkPattisonNFL.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So, until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.